On this edition of Native Report, we meet artist Tony Abeda and explore his sense of the world around him through his art. We visit two commercial radio stations owned and operated by the Keweenaw Bay Indian community. And we attend the Nike N7 Sports Summit at Nike headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon. We'll also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Stacy Fender. Artist Tony Abeda considers himself a regionalist. That much of what he does as an artist is tied to Native culture and place. His individual style incorporates bold colors, rich textures, and representations of Navajo deities. The aha moment, you know, that I was going to be a painter was I couldn't work for people anymore. I had jobs all throughout high school and I realized I couldn't, you know, work for another boss. He said, You're late, you're fired. I, I couldn't do it anymore. So I thought, well, it's all or nothing. Either I'm gonna be extremely good at one thing or great at one thing and not good at a bunch of little things, you know. I was a good projectionist and you know, I was uh, good at picking up after people in the movie theaters and and I could count up the registers and I could call in all of the information at the end of the night. But, you know, I wasn't really good at mathematics. I was uh, not a great student, but I had a good work ethic. I could paint. Tony Abeda grew up in Gallup, New Mexico, and cites his mother and father as great influences upon him becoming an artist. I never really wanted to be an artist, but it just seemed to happen through the osmosis of my father and my mother was a very creative person as well. Art was something that people did as a hobby is my understanding. So, you know, my father never really made a living off of painting, although he had work in museums and he was renowned. So we, we grew up pretty poor, so we struggled a lot. So I never thought of art as being an option to do full time. So I thought uh, graphics art or, you know, uh, advertising. So this was the mentality I thought of it. 15 years old and then at some point I saw an exhibition of art here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I came to the Institute of American Indian Arts and it was of contemporary uh, Native American painters and in that exhibition was a group of artists from all over the country. A lot came from the Institute of American Indian Arts and they were you know the movers and the shakers of progressive you know contemporary Indian art and I just said, wow, this is like a whole movement. This is something new and something different. And somehow I wanted a part of that. In addition to attending the Institute of American Indian Arts, Tony studied in New York, Chicago, and even Florence, Italy. Florence had this whole history of art. And some of the most phenomenal Renaissance art was created not only in architecture, um, painting, I remember going in <clears throat> to a museum for the first time and looking at just the floors. They were all mosaic and all this really amazing serpentine and marble and everything was parquet and, and, and there were these amazing uh, frescoes and bas reliefs and things that I'd never seen. So it's sort of a just experience of seeing things that you've only looked at in a book. And I always recommend for anybody who's a student of art to be able to get out and go see the context in which art was created. So not just going, you know, into a book of art and not just going into a museum, but being able to actually see the south of France gives you a much better insight to like who Van Gogh was, for example. These travels and experiences have formed who he is as a person 
a native man and the artist he has become. I grew up as a fairly urban Indian, so I was always sort of, you know, living in not only a small town of Gallup, New Mexico, but uprooted and then taken to like, you know, cities all over the country, all over the world. And so part of that, that dislodging from a sense of place and from the culture is all about finding it and rediscovering it. So for me, through my art, which is not only a meditative experience and a spiritual endeavor, I'm able to really discover, you know, a lot of, of what the experience of being Navajo is. What that experience about, you know, our mythology and our belief systems and, and our relationship to the cosmos and to this, you know, to the underworld, all of these things are part of how I think. Those are all my vocabulary. And those are all part of a cultural theme that is not even my own. It's 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 ours. It's it's intertribal and it's also part of a way that we believe in, in our environment, our world. These are the things that I that I'm stimulated and inspired by. So my art is about, you know, my people, but in general it's about it's about all of us. Drawing is another medium Toti has worked with from time to time, and recently he ventured into another art form. I've been a painter for, I don't know, like I said, maybe 20 years, I think, and I've diversified, so I've done sculpture. I did stone sculpture, but it took too long, and uh, drawing is, is an important part of how I work, and it's completely different from the painting. The imagery is completely different, so I paint with different hats on recently started uh, doing jewelry and that said jewelry has been a really interesting because it's such a Navajo experience it, it's so much about you know silver and stones and you know craftsmanship and design there's very simple sorts of design elements that go into it and composing and in it itself is, is a whole different way of thinking it's hard for me to go from expansive huge paintings down to these kind of filigree sort of, you know, bezels and, and stamp work or, you know, these things are changing my world. It's, it's, it's like my small universe expanding from this down to this. Tony has mentored emerging artists as well as his own children. The one bit of advice he gives is each artist must go through his or her own experience. I will intermittently go back and teach a couple classes at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Uh, I work with other younger artists just to sort of give them support. Whether that's like, I like what you're doing, I'll buy that little painting. But I try to keep uh, a connection to what's happening, what's current in contemporary Indian art. And always, if I see somebody doing something that I think is, is good, is amazing, I try to bring it to my attention, to, to the attention of my clients, to a host of you know networks of galleries that I know, and I'll say, hey, you ought to look at you know this person's work and um, you know give them a shelf. And sometimes they do, and that's the best thing you can do in you know uh, in sort of a young upcoming artist's life, you know, is try to give them a community and a community of support. For Tony Abeta, an empty canvas is full of possibilities, and it's the same for the future. I don't really set goals as much as I did when I was younger. Like, I want to be, you know, in this school, I want to graduate, I want to have a studio, I want big giant canvases, and so much of that has happened. So for me, it's, I'm, I'm sort of embarking on getting close to like, I'm going to be 50 pretty soon. And I look at that as, as sort of a, a marking point. What have I really achieved in you know, this, this span of time that I've been doing art? And you know, my goal, if I have any now, is just to continue being a painter. Sometimes people have to throw in the towel. There's always, I hear experiences of people, oh, hey, you're telling me I'm selling my art supplies. And I hear that and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, that's, that's the wrong direction. But people refine and redefine their lives. And sometimes art's not, you know, creating doesn't, always, it's not always the most responsible thing to do. But I want to continue painting and making art until I'm 96 years old. And then I'm going to retire.
Did you know that New Mexico has become an international center for the promotion of American Indian art? The Santa Fe Indian Market is a 91-year-old tradition. It is the largest and most prestigious native art market in the world. Over a thousand native artists from the U.S. and Canada come to sell their artwork, and the Indian Market attracts over 100,000 visitors to Santa Fe from all over the world. Buyers, collectors, and gallery owners come to Indian Market to buy directly from the artists. The artists come to Santa Fe from over 100 different U.S. tribes and Canadian First Nations. The market is held annually during the third weekend in August. Santa Fe, New Mexico is also home to the Institute of American Indian Arts, the only four-year fine arts degree institution devoted completely to contemporary Native American art. Next, at a time when more and more Native nations across Indian Country are developing their own radio broadcast stations, many, if not all, are community-based. The Keweenaw Bay Indian Community's situation is unique as owner and operator of two commercial stations. Picturesque Hancock, Michigan is home to the Eagle Radio main offices. But on this Monday morning, Eagle Country DJ, known to his listening audience as Big E, is broadcasting from the Barraga Studios. Ah yes, Brad Paisley and Carrie Underwood would remind me their latest right here on 105.7. On his latest album, This Is Country Music, and Reba McIntyre back there starting things off. Is there life out there? Good morning to you. 9.18, 8.18 Central Time. It's about 70 degrees here at the Berga Studios. I never imagined myself doing a country station, although my dad was in a band and country music and western music and a little bit of blues and old-time rock and roll was always his thing. But I've always listened to heavy metal, I've always listened to hard rock, classic rock, blues and stuff like that. So I didn't really know a lot about country music, but I actually prefer being on WCUP at this time because uh, uh, it grows on you. It really does. It affects you, and you pick up a lot of the songs and a lot of the lyrics, and either they match your life or they match somebody else that you know. It really affects you, and that's why I love music so much. Well, I usually get up about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I come in around 5.30. It gives me a half hour of prep work to go in and search for current news stories around the area or nationally. We use a number of different prep services that give you a little bit of content, maybe some comedy and things like that, and uh, forecasts, get everything together, uh, get our news jingles and all our weather jingles and bits together. And then right at the top of the hour at 6 o'clock, I come on live, and throughout the day, all the way up until about 2 o'clock, I either voice track in the afternoon, and then I'm live in the morning. Eagle Country is one of two commercial stations owned by the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, the other being the Rockin' Eagle. Native programming is offered through both. Our country station um, covers uh, the western central upper peninsula. We go from Marquette all the way up to uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, all the way down to uh, Ironwood, Michigan. So we cover a, a whole area that a lot of different stations can't do. So we're bigger and better than everyone else. Our rock station, actually, we've had calls in the middle of the night uh, from people over at um, uh, Grand Portage in Minnesota that have actually listened to our rock station. Thunder Bay, Ontario, they've listened to our, our rock station. Normally, you would see an indigenous program on a public uh, forum um, or a college forum. And ours is commercial, so we have to we actually you know put that into a, a spot and uh, and promote around that. So it, it, very important, very important for the Native American community, I think. The KBIC annual powwow is broadcast live each and every year as part of the cultural programming offered by Eagle Radio. The KBIC, you know, is uh, once again. Uh, steeped in Native American culture and they push that as much as possible and trying to keep involved with uh, the radio station. That's why we've had Indigenous Insights running for so long. And I mean, I think there was a year off that I didn't do Indigenous Insights, but it still kept going. It was still going. So, I mean, 
It's always been a priority for the KBIC, especially with Eagle Radio and, and being at a commercial radio station. There's still a lot of culture involved in it. Years ago, the community was involved in a radio station, and they were just partners at the time. And uh, the, that radio station was failing, and so they decided to buy out the radio station. And uh, an opportunity arose where uh, a couple of radio stations were for sale up north, up in the Houghton and Hancock area. And uh, one of our goals was to become the, one of the first Indian commercial, one of the first uh, Native American radio stations with a commercial broadcast. Uh, we're currently, we are number one with WCUP and number two with WGLI, a rock station. We take pride in being uh, uh, the only commercial radio station, the only Native American tribe that has a commercial radio station. Uh, it helps put our story out there. Uh, uh, we have a Sunday night program called Indigenous Insights that's al that allows uh, uh, local news and stuff about uh, Native Americans in our area. It does have a lot of value to it that we're able to uh, uh, put some of the things on the radio station that we want to that we want to hear. My brother, who was in World War II in Hawaii, he was at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed, uh, married a Hawaiian girl, came to New York and asked my mother and dad, can I take Laura, uh, I was known as Laura Jean, that's my full name, uh, to Hawaii for a year, you know, whatever. And so we drove across the country, got on a ship, and went to Hawaii. And I wound up living there for nine years. So I have sort of a third culture, and that's the Hawaiian culture. Um, I, I know the language fairly well. I know a lot of the ceremonies uh, because it was a traditional family, and they, and they had, you know, kahunas. If you got sick, the first person you called was not the doctor. It was the medicine person. And... Uh, and so I grew up in that sort of environment and came back to uh, then San Francisco. My mother was uh, had gone to live out there, and then she went on to become president of the American uh, Indian Center, which was involved in Alcatraz. And so she uh, didn't want to go to the island. That was She felt that was for young people. But she took charge of the logistics, the blankets, the food, the water, things like that. And so she was, she's always been my inspiration. <laughs> Nike N7 is a commitment by the Nike Corporation to bring sport and all of its benefits to Native American and Aboriginal communities in the United States and Canada. Recently, the first ever Nike N7 Sports Summit brought together Native American and Aboriginal partners and several world-class athletes. What started over a decade ago as an idea has turned into a movement. At the Nike N7 Sports Summit held at Nike World Headquarters, participants are inspired to help Native American and Aboriginal youth achieve good health through sport and physical activity programs. Our future depends on having a healthy people and starting with the individual. If we want to build the power of our nations, we have to have healthy young warriors to go out and become doctors and lawyers and advocates and sport athletes and, you know, targeting, you know, them on the individual level and not waiting for someone to come and give them their hopes and dreams but having that positive uh, mind frame that you learn from sport and learn from having a healthy body is going to take them to where they need to go and wherever the dreams are. This weekend at the N7 Summit uh, there was a meeting of the minds. Uh, people working in the trenches across Indian country and all over North America 
came here to share their ideas with each other, but also learn some tools, uh, learn from people like Lorenzo O'Neill and uh, you know Wilson Pipestem and people like myself about how we dealt with issues in, in achieving our goals, but also um, you know raising money, writing grant proposals. So it was an all-encompassing kind of conference. In addition to prominent sports figures like Juanique, the gathering attracted a variety of people, from athletes and coaches to community organizers and national leaders. It's exciting, and you know, there's um, for a lot of different reasons. When you get older, you know, you really want a chance to be able to help the next generation. And to me, that's what this opportunity is. But not to convince them to be future leaders. We want to convince them to be leaders now and today. And I think that message resonated good in the conference. We want to empower our young people to lead, and we want to have different strategies and ideas on how to lead. And with this diversity of so many people from so many diverse regions in this country and First Nations territories, just amazing. All these young people here, and and, uh, and, and their their chaperones or their counselors. It's not just young people. There's there's old guys, uh, me and Tex here too, you know. And I think we're really just excited about the ability to lead. Uh, the biggest thing, bottom line for me, is I challenge these folks to take what you learn here and resonate it ten times and, and share in your community and teach others. A summit is what it is. It's a chance for N7, Native 7, not just to shoe or their apparel, but you know, to bring uh, tribal leaders and tribal sports athletes and sports directors together to find uh, common ideas and strategies and plans on how to improve um, our athletes and uh, you know uh, just our recreational uh, uh, or our regular citizens who are trying to lose weight or maybe uh, having uh, trouble with diabetes and uh, you know there's a lot of as a common theme amongst all our uh, tribal nations that uh, a lot of our people get inflicted way too early and uh, our life expectancy is not the same as uh, off the reservation so uh, this is more than just a sports thing. This is really a matter of improving our lives. Not only is this talking about, you know, how do we fix, uh, you know, and help improve the li lifestyles of our people, but it's, hey, we're having our own brand. Not everybody can say they got their own Nike brand. It's kind of up to us on how do we carve that to make it even better to help improve the, the lifestyles of our people. Nonprofit organizations play important roles in the overall N7 mission. While encouraging Native youth to be physically active, they also raise awareness of common health issues across Indian country. We use sport to combat type 2 diabetes and childhood obesity. Um, we have a soccer program in San Felipe Pueblo and we also do golf. With golf we do uh, camps throughout the summer and try to teach the kids leadership through golf and nutrition and how to be better, you know, because I think we believe that etiquette within golf teaches you a lot outside of the golf course. Um, on Indian country, um, at least one in two kids will get type 2 diabetes um, because of just the way things have been. Um, and the good thing about it is that it's a disease that's um, preventable. And so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to get all the knowledge we can so that to help prevent it so that we can help reduce the incidences in Native communities. The summit is a catalyst for Native American and Aboriginal youth to be a force for positive change in their communities. When one generation realizes its potential, future generations are stronger. Sport has given me a lot. I was able to go to college on a golf scholarship. Um, I caddied on the LPGA and the PGA tours for 10 years, so it helped me get an education and provided me with a job, and I was able to travel and see the world. So it's just an, a way for the kids to kind of see that, hey, man, there's, there's more to life than just the reservation. Um, it's to the, have the ability to dream, you know, dream big. Um, why not go to college? Why not try to travel and see things that you read about in books? So that's what we try to do, you know, just really give these kids something to believe in. We have to get people to understand in order for us to live a good, healthy life, we have to exercise, we have to work out, and we have to be strong. N7 is the beginning. It's the beginning. Um, it's a catalyst for change. And everybody here, that's what the message has been all of the summit, be a change maker. And N7 has just given them a platform, a form to be able to do that. Now, 
we want to grow the fund. We want to make it more accessible to more people, have more money going into it. So you, the way it works at Nike is that you have to buy the N7 product and the money goes back into the fund and then you can apply for funding to your sport and wellness uh, work. So it's really, it's up to us. You know, it's really up to us whether we're going to make this successful. And I think it's a very, very important uh, change in Indian country. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. <laughs>